Welcome out everybody to the Three Martini Solution Podcast special episode under the banner of heaven, under the banner of heaven, where we discuss episode three. We're here with Jessica and Kyle and Casey and myself, Ryan. And uh, everybody's watched it at this point. I watched it twice. I watched it again tonight just to make sure that I remembered what was going on. (laughs) And uh, there was a lot going on. Uh, So, um, well, I'll just let you guys do a little bit of talking. Uh, Kyle, (laughs) you're the newest person to all this. What do you think? That first scene was bonkers like when they were i guess not the first thing but when they went into the temple and they showed that that like temple scene i had asked jessica i was like is that is that real like do they have like a whole changing room where they walk in wearing normal clothes and then change into superhero outfit kind of and then come out wearing normal clothes again i had never seen that before and i did not that was that caught me totally off guard what was jessica's response i'm interested to know (laughs) I've yet to ever be into a temple, so Casey, Anything what would be your response? It would be hearsay. <laughs> but she, but she did say she's like, yeah, that you walk in wearing like your normal clothes, and then you have your temple whites that you change into once you're there. Um, but that, that was, I was shocked by that. I never, <laughs> I did not know that that was a thing. So in case uh, people listen in and were like, well, why doesn't? Why doesn't this bearded um, pioneer man know about the temple? Uh, <laughs> despite the way Kyle looks, he didn't actually grow up LDS, nor is he. I uh, uh, are you a militia man? Uh, I'm not. I am Utah not. Man I am... Militia? Okay, you're not that. That's good. good He's to know. lazy. <laughs> Very true. His religion really is lazy. I desire not to shave. <laughs> uh, well, I won't put Casey on the spot. I can confirm for you, Kyle, that uh, that that whole temple scene was very, very accurate. <laughs> uh, the 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 dress, the room that they were in is in the Salt Lake Temple. It's very unique. Uh, I think some of the other temples might have murals drawn on the walls like that or not but definitely the Salt Lake Temple does and um, what they were showing there uh, can they don't I think we mentioned this before but they don't go into a lot of detail explaining what they're showing us uh, necessarily in every scene but that particular scene is is was a part of the temple ceremony where you promised to basically forfeit your life before you would divulge any thing you learned in the temple um, But they got rid of that part of the temple ceremony, I think, around 1990. So before myself or I think Casey probably went through it at all. And it was kind of a big deal at the time. It was kind of one of those big deal things that people didn't really talk about much um, unless you were in the temple. And then everybody's like, you wouldn't believe what they used to have (laughs) in the temple ceremony. (laughs) At least that's what people said to me. but again, I think that goes to show how there was this undercurrent of violence within the religion kind of and sets up, I think, what is to come, right? The well, whole- so the part that was like altered or modified was this part where you had to commit that like, you know, signing in blood that you will keep these secrets and it, like you know, what stays, you know, what happens in the temple stays in the temple, so to speak. Word. <laughs> okay. Why, do you know why they decided to modify that? Because it seems like that's still the undertone. Yeah, it is. I, I don't think, uh, I think that is the kind of the feeling and the, and what, what they would like you to take away from the whole experience still, regardless of whether you're pantomiming, slitting your own throat or not. Um, yeah, I am. I'm not 100% sure why they took it out other than it was a very creepy thing. And I think it, a lot of people, uh, were happy that it was gone because it felt creepy. Yeah. Put a bad taste in their mouth in the yeah. process. Do you, do you have any insight, seems... Casey? I'm sorry. Um, I, well, first of all, I don't think the church ever gives reasons for things that it does, especially in changing temple ceremony, um, particulars on um, my, I, I mean, If I were to hazard a guess, I think that, you know, while the church does modernize slowly, it does modernize. And I think that 
the context of making oaths and things changes, like things that are seem normal in the 1800s don't seem normal in the 1900s and, right. and vice versa. You know what I mean? When you, it's interesting because the, 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 the inspiration from much of the temple ceremony, it definitely has Masonic roots and you can look into that and the Masonic ritual and, and, and that part of it. Um, also though, I mean, there's a lot of old Testament symbolism that comes through it. Like when you read in the old Testament about when, um, God covenants with Abraham and the sacrifices that are there and some of the verbiage that's used in the old Testament, you know, those, those penalties, you know, to, to make it, to make an oath, a true Jew, um, like old Testament style oath, there has to be a penalty affixed. Um, mm. with with the laws and stuff so that's that's one of the, the the components of a covenant as opposed to the ten commandments which are different because the ten commandments do not have like a punishment attached they're sort of more like general like moral codes and that's why the ten commandments are sort of unique as far as um like middle eastern laws and stuff i mean this is getting a little deep into theology but but again I, but i think there's that's part of it right because you know mormons look to those things as legitimizing their tradition like that's where it comes from you know and and many mormons feel a real connection to that that old testament way of thinking and the old testament way of, you know discussing it i mean the, you talk about it i know for me um <clears throat> i have some friends who are jewish rabbis and we've had fantastic discussions about old testament are like my understanding of the old testament is you know, have been raised you know mormon and um their understanding of of you know the the hebrew bible as they would call it um you know it's their book you know so in, in many ways like christians are borrowing the book so those components of it aren't necessarily foreign in the sense that that but it's an old way of doing it and so i think really you're kind of asking the question what's our purpose in having people make promises right to god in a ceremony and a ritual um and if you're missing the point and you're not getting to the right like end then yeah you change it I, I would think but um you know if it does seem creepy then you you know then you change it so that it's no longer creepy and it's more focusing on the promise but i think the the, the piece that under the banner of heaven's getting at is that you know what happens is when you have people who like power they're going to use these reasons as ways to justify terrible things and you know legitimize some you know awful behavior towards their family and other people around them you know it's it's anyway that's a, that's kind of what i think a lot of this episode does and i think a lot of the, the discussion of some of the legitimacy or just some of the impact of this of the series is talking about it in that way like does all religion lead to violence no but has religion in general lead, led to a lot of violence in you and in like world history yes and so yeah. You know, it, it, it's one of those things where it can be really good and also really bad. And I think religious folks need to grapple with that to some extent. And I think, too, in some patriarchal societies, when, when certain patriarchal leaders abuse that power and use that to hurt people, I think sometimes because they feel that it, other leaders feeling that it's a threat to their power tend to temper or not like tamp down that abuse of the power in a way that would be you know they tend to kind of like well and sort of ignore it and different things like you see that in many many faiths i mean the i read an interesting article about it today we can talk about that later i've sort of been talking for a while so i'll let people <laughs> well no people i was gonna uh, sorry <laughs> i hit my microphone i was gonna ask you casey though uh, so what do you think the point of that that scene was to to show like what was what were the what was the director trying to get at i think the director is trying to show the connection from the lafferty brothers perspective of why they killed brenda in the way that they did that there are covenants in the temple ceremony and and gestures that mimic slitting of the throat her her um murder was done by slitting her throat and spilling her her blood out on the ground also alan lafferty says that you know he brings up blood atonement that certain yeah. sins can only be like certain sins are beyond the reach of you know christ's atonement type thing which is if you're a christian that blows your mind a little bit but um but some mormons believed that 
Um, and so that they say, oh, you need to, this is how you need to atone for your own sins in this way. And so I think the director is trying to draw a link between what the Lafferty's did, the covenants that they had previously made in the temple, and you know how that can be used to justify some of those things can be used to justify violence, or how some of the, how those things were possibly used to justify violence in the words in in Dan Lafferty's mind. You know, Krakauer's book relied a lot on interviews with Dan Lafferty, so we're getting a lot of his perspective, which I think is why it's a slightly skewed perspective of Mormonism. Like that's the biggest source of the information, rather than you know, run-of-the-mill Mormons sitting down at City Creek Mall in downtown Salt Lake City type thing. Yeah. What did you think of it, Jessica? You know, it. you warned me that it only gets heavier, and it, it certainly does. Like, it's, it, it's hard to not feel triggered. I mean, something that seemed so small in that episode, like, uh, like has re- like out of everything, the parking lot dispute after that scene in the temple where the patriarchal father comes and is furious about the state of his affairs, how he left it to Dan and uh, goes to pull out his belt and zero hesitation of doing it in front of other family members and children out in the open but it was the church member who pulls up in her car (laughs) and is just like, uh, hey, how's it going? Clearly can see that there's a physical confrontation. And in my opinion, at least had the balls to like pull up alongside them and say something. But in my very first, like my own experience growing up in the church, that turning a blind eye to abuse was something that I witnessed quite frequently. Like I remember as a child setting in church service and you just cringed when you saw a father pull their kid out and take them back to an empty classroom. And, you know, that this could travel into, you know, different abuse and things like that. But for me, it was very common practice and seeing many times in my childhood a line being crossed um, in the church setting. But I remember my parents, you know, signing me up for like babysitting gigs for church members and me being very, very uncomfortable in other people's home with some of that intensity of physical discipline, if I'm saying it really nicely. So that, that one moment in that episode, like I like how to take a deep breath and is what resonates out of the entire episode for me, probably because it just hits home a little bit closer. Um, But like take church completely out of this scenario. And I do think that children that go through some intensity of that, you know, there's that adds to violence and other components where, you know, the church isn't necessarily condoning it or um, preaching that that's what you should do. But if you read between the lines in some circumstances, maybe it is. So I don't know. That was the heaviest part for me. (laughs) It it was a pretty heavy part. And you kind of, the the thing that I like about this this show, um, especially in this episode and in the second episode, I think they get the tone so right. Like mm-hmm. that sort of weird energy, that uncomfortable energy, it's not pleasant, but they get it right because mm-hmm. it is very familiar to things that, like you were saying that you you, you would have seen or experienced uh, growing up in the church. But I'm sure it's not unique to Mormonism. Right, right, for sure. And is also probably what led to <laughs> abuse of how, you know, if you if you grow up and that is your role model example in your father, like that's how, you know, patterns, uh, you know, it takes strong people to, to break those patterns in and, family dynamics. And yeah, and I think um, it's worth saying, I think, you know, that 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 tone that I'm, I'm mentioning isn't the ordinary, right? <laughs> you don't see that in, in, in everybody, but you do see it. Um, l- let me ask uh, Kyle, other than that temple scene, is there is there another scene that stood out to you? 
Um, related with that temple scene, like the the uh, Jeb uh, Officer Pyre uh, walking up to the cabin, like taking, uh, put down your guns, and it was related back to that because he kept kind of trying to go back to the. I understand that you guys no longer observe human's law. Man's law is no longer a thing that you care about. So I am stripping away my official title as officer and I am coming to you as a brother because that is, that's a more, a more powerful law. The only law that you will now see is that spiritual law, God's law. And so having to kind of try and change that role and get people to see those, those people to see him as a Mormon and not as a police officer where they're willing to talk and kind of having to go back through that and talk about how um, it reminded them of the mill and they're not going to be martyred and we're not going to go through this and flash cuts to Joseph Smith, like kind of turning the other cheek saying like, we're not going to choose violence. We aren't going to go that way. And then showing slowly and how Joseph Smith changed from that. We are going to be peaceful. We're not going to get the guns. We're not going to do that to, slowly but surely Brigham Young talked him into based on the show becoming more violent having to take a stand and having to do that and we are we're doing God's work and so we need to do this work and we can't be held down by laws that are unjust and man-made and not good for us and I think that was tied in with that temple scene of showing that there's a greater power there's a a law above all else yeah Uh And what, what, so from your perspective, why is it useful for them to be going through and showing these cutscenes to early Mormonism and tying it to these stories that we, the rest of us here, on, at least on the podcast, probably remember sometimes growing I, up? Sometimes I question my memory. So like Kyle will ask questions and I'm like, well, I mean, we're talking about what I remember from, you know, two decades ago. And <laughs> as those stories come up, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so great. I was right. Yup. I remembered that, how they're certainly portraying it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for but, me, that's been a little eye opening of like, oh, that is how I remember them explaining that story. Do you, th- uh, do you think it's moving I'll be along? To see if, oh, oh sorry. No, go ahead. I, I'll, I'll be interested to see if they kind of show more of the what happens once it's turned that corner. Like so far, it has been showing the persecution of the Mormons and how they've been tarred and feathered. Yeah, and, and how they've had to like come together and why they are that insular community because the whole United States was against them and kept kicking them out, out of cities and shunning them and telling them they had to get out and it doesn't matter and we'll shoot you and kill you. And it switches. I'm like, there's a certain point in time where the Mormons have been pushed too far and Brigham Young gets his army and Joseph Smith gets, I'm like, so there's a lot of other tales that don't have that same kind of positive light of the Mormons, which I think so far those histories have shown Mormons for the most part being regular people. Just this is our, we just want to be left alone and go about and do our business. And other people are not letting us do that. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm a fan of history. So I think that they're very interesting to see that. Um, so you and, think it helps tell the, 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 the more, the, the story of the murders it's, it's, it's helping to inform that story. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. Kind of showing why, like, I think a lot of people might question why Mormonism is such an insular thing. Why is it so tightly wound and why is there such a close knit community of, of people based strictly around a religion? When you look around most of America and you have lapsed Catholics or Christians in name all, I mean, you have all these people who would say they're religious, but don't, don't go to the mat for their other Christians. Like it is appearing that is happening in the show and kind of giving some of that history about why it's what the persecution was and why they're so close knit as a community and against law and against the government and kind of some of that backstory. Mm -hmm. I think some of it though helps also tell the other story that they're writing about. Like I think of the part where Alan's trying to justify the fact 
that Brenda's dad didn't really like him because Joseph Smith's uh, wife, why can't I think of her name? Emma. Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith, yes. <laughs> that her dad didn't like Joseph Smith. And ultimately, Joseph Smith persuades her to still, you know, defy her father and come with him. So I think that was episode two. But like, for me, that didn't ring true. I was like, oh, well, that story I never heard. So it felt like it kind of was more within just this show that tried to create a parallel or a connection to that mentality. Yeah, that's um, a that's an interesting point because, you know, they, they show all they they're showing these cutscenes, And yeah, I don't think Emma's dad really did like Joseph that much. <laughs> yeah. Obviously not something that the church wants to focus on. So I, I don't think what they're portraying there is, is false. I, I just wonder, um, and maybe if I do any amount of research, I can answer my own question here, but is how much those scenes were really on the minds of the um, brothers when they were doing all this, or right. if it's more just a storytelling um, tool to to kind of inform the viewers that may not be affiliated with the Mormon Church a little bit more about what it's about, and and then try to draw a stronger connection between modern day Mormonism and the Mormonism of you know the eighteen hundreds. What do you think, Casey? Well, <clears throat> I think it was definitely something that they did rely on, and even you know the the Bundys in modern times also were citing you know mormon scripture and stuff to justify their challenge and defiance of the federal government too um you know, i think and that's a very mormon instinct to take old stories and m make them yours and find parallels you know the, the mormon word for that was likening the scriptures to yourself right mm -hmm. we're taught to do that from the very beginning to look for yourself and, and look for yourself in these stories that you read in scripture and stuff and then and make them apply to you, which, you know, that can be a very valuable tool, but 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 it's also taken to an extreme. That's an exercise in proof texting and, and finding justifications for almost anything because, you know, scriptures are complex stories that, you know, humans have used for a very long time. And these are the reason these stories have stayed around for so long is because they're useful, right? They're meaningful. Yeah. There's a lot of you know meaning that can be derived from them. So people can use them in all sorts of different ways. You know, on, on one hand, you know, you have this story of these patriarchal leaders who are abusing their authority, the Lafferty family, right? And using like scriptural or religious justifications for doing that, feeling threatened by this woman and then choose and finding um, justification for, you know, beating her down, you know, murdering her and, you know, patriarchal authority has been abused, you know, somewhat regularly throughout human history. I mean, you know, I mean, that that's, <laughs> I think that goes without saying, especially in Western culture, but I mean, but again, you can also read in, in Mormon theology about how as soon as you give a man any authority, he's going to like have, exercise unrighteous dominion over something. So you have these, these counterpoints in like Mormonism that sort of saying, Hey, here's the recipe for violence, but then also here's the antidote for it too. And I'm interested to see like if the the series kind of goes into that a little bit because i think it's definitely exploring how um violence begets violence where you know violence in mormons more mormons history led to more violence or justification for violence where you, whether you talk about blood atonement or any of the things that were going on there or even you know joseph smith and the nauvoo legion or the lafferty's or the bundy's or you know it can do that um, but are they going to find, are they going to do an answer for it? Or they, is it just going to be some sort of screed against religion? And I, I, I'm, I, I'm, 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 from what I hear it, there's a danger that it's just going to be a screed that's anti-religion because of crack hours, like the SSC kind of goes that way. But anyway. Well, so I feel like, oh, go ahead. Oh, so going back to what you said, where you kind of, I don't think it's just the Book of Mormon, but I think religious text as a whole has very much of, um, relating to a board game that I first played at Ryan's house, Mysterium. And they have the cards with crazy pictures on them. And there's tons of different stuff going on in each card. And I feel like religious texts are written in, in a way where you can use that, where you can translate the same piece of information in four or five different ways to suit your needs so that you can justify almost anything you're doing 
using that text. And I feel like that's, I don't think that's just a Mormon thing, but that is all religion. And I, that's when I, when I hear people quoting religious text or using religious text to justify something, that's the, the first thing my mind goes to is like, where else has that been used? That same passage, that same text been used to justify the complete opposite of what you are saying or two lines down, it says something completely different and you can just kind of go through and pick and choose to justify anything. Well, and let's say that this is the, the what they're trying to justify. This was her blood atonement. But what did that baby do? <laughs> it's a justification for killing the 18 month old. Like, like, is that like, hopefully like that's the most, I mean, obviously any murder is awful, but a innocent baby, like, how do you, what, what text is ever going to justify that? Yeah. It, and it seems like the uh, brothers that they have in custody, I can't remember. Uh, Robbie. Robin. 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 Yeah. Alan. Uh, Alan Al- and Sam. <clears throat> and Sam. The, the Robin and, and Alan seem pretty, well, I mean, I guess Alan knows what's going on, but when Robin finds out, do they really, are they really okay? Are they okay? He, he seems to really not know. And really, and when they show him the pictures, appears devastated. Like this seems yeah. to be too far even for a guy who looks pretty extreme. So I mm-hmm. think that that story may have yet to been told. Like how did they get around to the point of justifying uh, a baby's, uh, the murder of a baby? I mean, right. just... Well, you know, I think, I, I don't know if Dan Lafferty talks about it in his interview with Crack Hour, if it comes out at all. But um, <clears throat> I think that in the show, they're trying to show a linkage and saying that, you know, the Lafferty's that committed this violence internally are no different than the mobs that killed the Mormons at Hans Mill, because they made a very explicit reference to those Missouri, the Missouri mob who also chose to kill the little boys. That's said, right. They're like, why are you killing the boys too? And they're like, well, you know, nits grow up into be lice type thing. And so, you know, which is an interesting comment about purity about who considers himself like a pure member of this like in group, because also the the, the wife of when she's sitting in one Sarah, of the, the yeah. wife of when, yeah Sarah when she's sitting in the car and she's like oh yeah Brenda wasn't like a a, a real Mormon she was mm-hmm. attracted to like converts or whatever so you had to like be born into it and, and to be like true whatever yeah. and what's interesting pure. is yeah. if Alan is pure. Like it's all this pure blooded stuff, right? And the minute you like pollute it with something else, all of a sudden your pure blood isn't worth anything. Which I mean, I guess you can read that in the New Testament with salt and lot losing its savor and things. But, and I mean, Harry Potter. <laughs> sure. I mean, but right, those purity ideas come out and how dangerous some of those are because they justify really bad things. Yeah, I, I I think it's a I think the reason why it is in other literature is because it it is a, a theme that for some reason we humans understand right the in group and the out group and they're and they uh you know it doesn't take much to probably get pushed into the out group uh right. you're talking about extremists um well let me let me ask you this i, I wrote down some of the other non like the, the things kind of surrounding the the murder storyline um because they 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 have the the storyline with off uh detective Pyrie and his family and his mother and that kind of stuff. Um, and what do, what do you think of that storyline? Is that, is that necessary? Is it unnecessary? What are your thoughts on that? I, for me, the watching the girls go in to meet with the bishop before their baptism, like mm-hmm. I do think that gives some insight, like when you think of what he prioritizes. Like he misses his girl's birthday party, but he'll be damned if he's going to miss the meeting with the bishop that gives them the, you know, seal of approval. For me, I remember being eight years old and going through that process. And I asked, why do you have to be eight years old to be baptized in the church? And they talked about free agency, that, it, that you need to be old enough to make this choice for yourself. And then they explained how it washes away your sins. And my instant thought was, well, then why the hell would I do it at eight? (laughs) I am 
I'm I got I I have a feeling <laughs> I got some mistakes to make ahead of me. I'm gonna save this baptism. And yet you didn't make really any more mistakes. Get a clean slate. <laughs> and I like I in my eight year old way was trying to tell my parents, like, oh, well, then if it's my my choice, then I choose to wait. And they're like, <laughs> never. <laughs> and my my mom makes my baptismal dress, unlike uh, Jeb's very talented wife with her dresses. My mom doesn't put any lining in it. So literally the second I come out of the baptismal tub or pool, whatever you want to call it, immediately flash the entire crowd <laughs> right through this white dress. I was horrified so of course I like it brings up so many memories that just have not been on my mind for a very long time but I felt like then the discussion into him opening up to his bishop about the troubles he was having with his mom and her pain it was so interesting to then uh, the bishop says something like shelf it yeah. Essentially, like, don't ask those questions. Don't be a critical thinker. Right. And then for Alan to say that to him at the police station in their discussion, it does show that there are some very big, I don't know, catchphrases or um, buzzwords. But yeah, that like they're trained on how to get people to stop asking questions or when something is yeah that you should know well i have a question before we get into that first so jessica when you went in for your baptism interview were you alone or did you go with your whole family no i um was alone so it was one-on-one -on -one. i did not go with my parents i do remember i did go i told kyle i i did baptismal uh baptisms for the dead so that was the one time i entered like a small part of the temple that you know children are allowed to enter outside of like uh, like wedding ceremonies and whatnot. Um, and that was with my father one-on-one -on -one, who was the bishop at the time. So there was <laughs> no, not going there. <laughs> Obviously I was not honest in that interview. <laughs> um, I, like what option did I have? Like, of course I <laughs> okay the word up with, um, you know, so I, yeah, it's, well, yes, it was even at that young of an age, it, uh, it did not have my parents accompany me. Right. Because the my point was, yeah, in the 80s, I think most of those interviews would have been done one on one with the bishop and the child, which, you know, Black, if he was really trying to go for a creepy vibe, he could have done, he could have leaned into that a little bit rather than. Yeah. Because now, now the interviews are done with like parents. bishops of your children alone. So. So I, I got to think, a good rule. I, I remember being what are with my parents when I had mine. Like, oh, really? Yeah, so I, remember, were... I remember my mother and father being there. Practices, right? It's not. Yeah. So, so I, was, I, I really wanted to talk about the scene because <laughs> I, I spotted a few things. One, Jeb doesn't wear a tie, which doesn't wear a white shirt and tie, which I don't know what Mormon in the 80s is going to go to any sort of meeting with the bishop not in a white shirt and tie so total garbage right there and then <laughs> i've never seen a bishop's office look that nice how about you casey I mean, no like that isn't <laughs> yeah, let's most move Mormon... this over to the leather couch sitting area <laughs> not not typical no well it, most mormon uh bishop's office look like uh you know old school house you know closets or something <laughs> they're, they're very sparse they're not that nice at least anywhere that i've ever been um so it's very it was a very nice bishop's office um but some of those things like kyle was saying these buzzwords or maybe it was jessica was saying the buzzwords and the things that he gives so i i, I guess i i think the point of showing that scene my guess is to show how um you know, Pyrie's really going through something serious with his mom and there's not um, answers within the church. The church isn't giving him really good answers or direction. That 
pastoral care that you should probably be receiving from your pastor, or in this case, your bishop or whoever, this seems to be lacking. And, and really, instead of substance, they give him, they're giving him these buzzwords, these just catchphrases to use that hopefully make things better. And and I think that most people probably look at that and think, well, that's horrible. And, and that's probably what they're trying to show. And that's, I, I don't know, I, I believe that that's a fair criticism uh, to some degree. However, I see things also from the bishop's perspective, <laughs> because within the church, I think uh, what maybe people don't know, uh, maybe Casey, I'd like to hear if you agree or disagree. <laughs> I'm sure you'll tell me anyway, whether I want to hear it or not. Uh, <laughs> but I, so bishops, you think would get a lot of training <laughs> for to handle situations like that. Yeah. And unless they are in a profession that deals with those sorts of interactions, they're not receiving any training. So like yeah. most of the training that the bishops are getting is very much similar to the things you might hear in a general conference. Basically, read your scriptures, stay close to the spirit and let the spirit guide you in answering these questions for people. And I got to believe that a lot of bishops are in a position where when they somebody walks in with some very serious, very real issues and the person is looking to them to answer the questions they're uh, not prepared to really deal with those in a meaningful way and so what do they do they fall back to the common tropes that they've maybe heard in the past and they mm -hmm. give those things hoping that it works so um you know maybe i'm giving the bishop in this uh uh episode more credit than he's due but um i when i watched that i felt for the bishop as well because i'm like oh he's not prepared he's not, <laughs> he's not prepared for that conversation and a lot and he's been put in a position where he is the authority figure that is supposed to have the answers and uh is is probably not fair to either one of the people having that conversation yeah no, no, i what would say as um a person who works with kids I, i'm a teacher and so like i've dealt with those types of emotional questions and mental health issues like more and more. And I think as someone who has that job, like I know that that is something that is becoming a bigger and bigger issue among high school kids. And it's, it's my job. It's our job as teachers to learn about how to answer those questions better than say, this is a test. This is God's way of testing you. I mean, like mm -hmm. I may not have the answers, but I know, where to direct them to actually get answers. And I feel like- Well, he directed them to pharmaceuticals. No, he said, don't take pharmaceuticals. No, he oh, said, no. No, he he said, said don't take, take pharmaceuticals. Oh, I did. He said, oh, yeah. oh no. he did? Oh, okay. Which I, I think is so interesting when you look at other religions like Scientology, that is like, you can't even trust a psychologist, <laughs> let alone take a medication. But it's like when he speaks about how many women in the, um, yeah. I don't know, the ward uh, actually are on them. I was like, oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. Do, do you For know if anybody has some extra that, that are, they're selling on the right, side? Exactly. Is there a specific doctor I need to go to to prescribe these? Well, what was interesting though is, you know, Ryan, <clears throat> I agree that, you know, all of these roles are filled by volunteers, right? So it's, it's, yeah. And, and training is done on the job, on the fly, and really quickly. I think I think the training has improved in the past 20 years, probably, because you're seeing an organization change from where these religious leaders are using sort of um, perhaps like practical frontier wisdom to help people in a very similar situation to now, you know, bishops are across the globe and giving things. So there's much more like general stuff and there's and like guidance towards more professional stuff in the handbook that they all refer to when they're doing these kinds of things. They refer to that because because that is really really difficult. But what I thought was interesting about that interaction with with Jeb and the uh, and the bishop was that the bishop said, "Hey, there's nothing wrong with pharmaceuticals. They can be helpful." I mean, he does sort of throw women under the bus with kind of a, a backhanded for emotional problems, right? <laughs> and there's lots of emotional problems. I mean, the, the the over the top sexism that they throw into this is a, is sometimes a little bit on the nose, but, yeah. um, but at the same time, 
Jeb disregards that because he doesn't want to hear it. And so you, you see that conflict. I mean, they're obviously setting Jeb up for a future faith crisis. And mm-hmm. so he's not totally. listening to his bishop. He's not, he's only going, he's going his own way. They're setting himself up for that. But like, he doesn't want, but like, but at the same time, that's a very real thing. He's like, I love my mom and the little tiny piece, a tiny fragments of my mom that I still get, I want to keep. Um, while his wife is like, yeah, but you don't have to deal with like the 90% of the rest of the day where it is super scary and all that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if we're going to talk about it later, Ryan, but like, I thought the interaction and the, 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 the conversation between Jeb and his wife afterwards was very interesting. That, yeah. that dynamic. Let's talk about that. But if we just want to go back, the the whole thing with the the mom, I think it's I think they play it very well. I don't know if, how necessary it is to the storyline, um, but I it's a very heart wrenching part of this thing. Every time I see uh, those scenes of the mom, I'm like this is just so hard to watch because I think they do a good job of making it so real. Be- you know, having a, a you know a family member on my wife's side who dealt with dementia issues and stuff like that, and and it's very serious. And you see, like that actress that plays the 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 grandmother <laughs> does a great job. Everybody does a great job in this, but but the, it's very heart wrenching to see some of those scenes because I'm like, oh, that's so real and it's so difficult. And I and I sometimes wonder. I'm like. We have don't we have enough to worry about with these two other people <laughs> getting murdered that we have to have our <laughs> this other scene that's so depressing, um, but they do such a good job of it. Um, but yeah, talk about that scene that comes up afterwards when um, Jeb is talking to his wife in 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 the in the, uh, in the bedroom the postponement there. Postponement of the baptisms, yeah. right? That was what essentially it was about. Yeah, and he's like, I think I want to postpone it, which is interesting because dramatically they don't give any basis for it they don't show where why he would have any issues with his daughters getting baptized because there's no connection between what's going on in the 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 murder investigation and his daughters being baptized which i found that a little hard to believe but um that he would actually do that like if he's going to do something he's he's going to choose other things first besides that probably but um But at the same time, the dynamic of him saying, hey, I want to do this and her giving all of the reasons, you're going to disappoint the girls. They're going to feel ostracized. That's all very, very true. I'm going to be embarrassed in front of the ward. That's all very, very true. And then for him to hold, pull out the, the tried and true, I'm the priesthood holder thing. You know, I'm the father of the home. I mean, any 1950s family can recognize that, you know, that line of thinking. And then, but what's interesting is how then she wields that soft power back at him yeah. right, with all of the, with, with all the things, not only just the sex, but like just everything saying, Hey, don't yeah. do this. And like trying to find a way through it, which was that, that power dynamic between the two of them is really interesting to me. I think that dramatically is really interesting because it shows how it's a very real thing that I think a lot of, you know, married couples deal with. And then you just layer on all these other things, right? Because every married couple comes to that relationship with their own baggage of patriarchy, sexism, misogyny, like their culture, all that religion, all those things. And it gets it gets messy quick when they're trying to make decisions about what to do with their family. Yeah, Jessica and Kyle, what did you what what did you guys think of that scene? I mean, I like the other piece that she added was just the logistics of her parents already had a trip from Arizona came out like she had (laughs) legitimate reasons to not rock this boat I mean my initial take was the baptism was because like you said it's setting the stage for his faith crisis so could that have been one of the first things that like was a very atypical behavior of him of coming out of that bishop's meeting and and not knowing um with the complexities of that if he could confidently do that baptism ceremony uh because he would be the one baptizing his daughters so like that was my initial read into it what i feel like with his mom with that interaction with his wife is just character development for jeb so like even when he said i am the priesthood holder like he did not say it Uh, from my perception with any level of like true confidence like almost like 
cringing as the words came out of his mouth. So I feel like it's really to continue to develop uh, who he is. Kyle, at the end of the first episode, or even maybe shortly into it, he's like, Jeb's a creep. Like, I got a bad feeling about him. (laughs) He's not a good guy. And I was like, what? He was playing with his daughters on the lawn. Like, how good of a guy, you know what I mean? And so for me, each episode, I grow more confident that he has good character and he has this crazy dilemma of a responsibility and uh, to his religion, but also what he's faced with, with solving a murder and having to face maybe some difficult uh, truths about some of his fellow Mormons yeah so I for me I think it's all just to develop him I think he's the main guy um so it's all just character development so what do we what do we learn of Jeb in that scene then if it's character do you still think he's creepy no okay (laughs) like I thought I I got the creepy vibe from the very like first episode when um he like jumps in and cuts off Taba in the interview as soon as he learns that he lost his faith Mm-hmm. That, um, that Alan lost his faith and then he jumps in and is very defensive of the faith. And that's why I got the like, oh, he's he also cares more about the religion that he does actual justice or the law. And I have quickly, quickly gotten over that side of things. And um, yeah, they immediately put yeah. him like back in the handcuffs <laughs> yeah. went from good cop to bad cop real fast. I'm both good cop and bad cop. <laughs> uh so yeah I, I agree with casey though in that particular scene when they're in the bedroom i don't i don't know if they prepared the viewers me, us as the viewers for um the turn that that took i didn't see that coming i don't i don't think there was foreshadowed in anything that they had set out there and it seemed uh, in a lot of ways out of character for jeb like i i think the character of jeb they've shown so far is he would be like no, this is a good thing happening in our lives. Our, these two girls getting baptized. I'm going to go ahead with this because I need this more than ever uh, mm-hmm. in the face of all this horrible stuff I'm seeing. I think that would be the more uh, realistic thing that you would see out of a, a character in that situation, at least a you know good Mormon boy character. Um, so and so they don't really prepare us for it, but maybe it is showing cracks in the facade or something like that. Um, I do. I, I looked at that when I saw that. I went back to episode two when um, Brenda um, is in the journalism room and wanting to get that job. And then her professor goes up and locks the door. And I felt like not not the same situation, but a, a power dynamic where sex was involved and that kind of how do those two women handle that situation differently? And I, I feel like it shows much more of the Brenda being like the modern, newer, more abrasive, like coming straight out and saying like, hey, do you lock the door with all of the people? Is that something that you'd want to make sure that your higher ups know that you're locking the door while we're alone? Maybe you should go double check and push hard to make sure that I get that job. Whereas um, Jeb's wife is much more subtle with that kind of achieving the same result, trying to influence and trying to have some power, but doing it in a much kind of more subdued way. Yeah. And I, I compared those two kind of scenes in my head. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I didn't draw that connection, but I think you're right. Like they, they, they're, they're both using their feminine, something that's feminine about that to, to turn the situation around for sure. Right. I, I think the, the one card they have. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing they're good looking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not, not let those guys get away with all that. <laughs> I don't think that was the point of what they're trying to show. Uh, the but but I you know when he says like you know uh, you know I'm the priesthood holder I've made my decision. I can see people in 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 Mormon in the Mormon Church do that. Not not everybody. <laughs> like I think it's yeah. almost like a, it's almost a 
it's almost a thing that like they talk about it and they're like, oh, you're the priesthood holder. You need to make the decisions. Uh, and they, I know they say to the women, in, you know, in Relief Society, you need to support your husband. If he's made a decision, you need to support it, blah, blah, blah. I think in practice, oh, just very, cool. that doesn't happen as often. And in the situations where it is happening, those probably aren't very healthy relationships. Well, and it doesn't start in Relief Society. It starts in young women's. Oh. Like as a girl in the church, that dialogue and the explanation of why men hold the priesthood and we never will starts at a very, very young age. And the overwhelming uh, experience I had was that it is such a burden that the men are, <laughs> are, are protecting us oh, from the burden on the, the struggle and how difficult <laughs> that job is. And so we, what we're asked to do in tending for the children and, you know, be, fulfilling this role is, is only, doesn't even, is not even a fraction compared to the struggle that they have on their shoulders. And, 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 from my earliest memory in the church, when we, especially as young women, that was always and ever present. And, and they got ahead of it <laughs> before <laughs> you even asked those questions, they were giving you the answer to them. Wow. Is that ring true to me too? And like not even being Mormon, but just as like growing up in a household where my dad was the, the breadwinner, like my dad went out to work every day and then my mom was home raising us and when something happened or a decision needed to be made, you know, that is because I said so. And that was, I mean, without even having that religious background, it seems almost like that's, that's just society or that is not all societies, but the Western society, men have that power. And then different religions put on their trappings to kind of reinforce something that's already there. Like, I don't know how much that has anything to do with Mormonism other than, Mormonism taking advantage or religion taking advantage of a structure that's already there yeah. to then be like, oh, this is. Well, I think it's a fair yeah. criticism. I'm not the first person to come up with it to say that, you know, uh, sometimes feel like Mormonism is, uh, you know, the LDS church is stuck in the 1950s. Um, and I think that is a very 1950s idea of the man being the breadwinner, coming home, making the rules, laying down the law and the wife saying, you know, the June Cleaver. Yes, honey. <laughs> Would you like to put your feet up, and I'll bring you the paper. And yeah. and I think that that just was probably lived had has a, had a longer lifespan within uh, the Mormon Church or any church maybe uh, of a similar nature uh, than it did in in the secular society where you know women have had been able to make decisions on their own for decades now. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a dynamic in my marriage so <laughs> yeah and so but it, it's a very uncomfortable truth i think that's that's being shown there is that this does happen and it's, it's very uncomfortable to watch and knowing that it's not made up bs and it, it really happens and it's, it's you know it just, it's just, I, I don't know, people who are very devout, I don't know if they watch that and interpret it the same way uh, as we might, but yeah. I, I think it's, you know, from my perspective, it's pretty accurate, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I, the challenge, whenever you see a group that you belong to portrayed in the media or in Hollywood or something, whenever you feel uncomfortable, like very few of us are comfortable dealing with our own cognitive dissonance, right? Whenever we like, oh, there's my group portrayed. And, and even though privately I might be like, oh, whatever about my group, certain things that I'm uncomfortable with, when you see it portrayed on the big screen like that, you're like, oh, we're not all like that, right? Because mm -hmm. then, because what happens is because it's hitting a tender spot, you tend to think, oh, why are they emphasizing the bad? Because I like to, I want to represent the good, right? I mean, families go through this, right? Whenever your your child tells you that, tells that embarrassing story that happened, that, that one time that one thing happened or whatever, and you're like, gosh, why can't you talk about all the times when, you know, I actually was kind as a parent, you know? All, <laughs> it's just like, you know, that instinct is very human. And, but this is the Mormon flavor of that, you know? Yeah. You know, another thing- I wonder- Oh, go ahead. Oh. 
watch watching that with like with a good Mormon couple or a practicing Mormon couple, how do they view that? Do they, I mean, do they see the wife kind of fighting against the, I hold the priesthood, you should support me as like, she's not doing what she should be doing. I mean, like, how would they view that? That I'm very interested to see if they would frown on her trying to dispute her husband, or if they would say, oh, he shouldn't have phrased it that way or he shouldn't have done that or if they would take his side i don't think you're going to see a uh an across the board way of doing that like i know in my own family and i i won't out my parents other than i just did um, like (laughs) there were times growing up when you know one of the things that you do um you know jeb was going to baptize his kids um you know also using that priesthood you the priesthood holder will also name children right and so when, when there were discussions in my family about what a certain child, or you know, how a certain child would be named or whatever, and my dad would say tongue in cheek, well, I'm the priesthood holder, I'm the one blessing it, so I'll just name the child whatever I want so I get sort of the right of veto. And my mom would respond, you go right ahead and you'll see a woman walk from the back to the front, grab a child, and you might not see that child again, right? <laughs> like, I mean... I mean, my parents were definitely young people in the 80s, not exactly the same age as, as Brendan and stuff, but like close. And <clears throat> so it, I don't know how typical my parents are necessarily. I mean, it's, but, but again, so there's definitely, you know, Mormons who would, every Mormon's going to know the I'm the priesthood holder excuse or justification. But I think many Mormons are also going to know that, yeah, sure, you know, roll your eyes type thing. Um, but, but again, some families are going to take that very literally. And I, I do know some who did and do. So it's, it's and, and when you see that happening, when they take it literally, you're like, oh, it's not literal, right? You know, it's like, <laughs> right. Well, and then she didn't have, she hatred. didn't have, she didn't have fear in raising her objection, right? No. And then she also decides like, Hey, we're both in this together. I have some cards to play too. So that, and, and they make love, right? So there's this almost, you can see some evolution and growth there because I do think um, I certainly know family members that would never let their husbands get away with a, like, I make this decision. I hope Which ones? Should, but still <laughs> hold it, <laughs> but still hold it in high regard. Right. So for me, I think like uh, the different, the spectrum of where you fall is continuing to be portrayed in those relationships because you you certainly don't see that dynamic with Alan's dad when he decides to not give his eldest son Mm -hmm. his business and the eldest son runs away and pouts and his mom secretly runs to him to let him know like you're number one but never in a million years would challenge his father on making that decision or even be very public about her disagreement there that's definitely uh like the old testament i mean it it happens in families for sure but that's that whole you know rebecca and jacob story in the old testament type thing that's you know going behind the back of the patriarch and and telling the son you just wait i got you type Mm -hmm. thing but I mean she's doing the same thing she also tells Brenda later hey or she tells Matilda right there's a lot of stuff that we do as women we just don't tell the men we can't let them bother about it like we're a lot smarter than they think we are and we want them to think we're dumb because then we can get away with more type thing so they're all exerting power in sort of their own interesting ways and making the most but I thought what I thought was interesting is I think we're seeing perhaps a little cliffhanger when Brenda makes the phone call at the end saying, oh, yeah. hey, we need <laughs> to save these brothers or whatever, I'm like, hmm, is she getting more fundamentalist in her views or is she going to really try and pull them out? Like, where is she going? Yeah. So there, Alan made a comment earlier in that, too. I just wanted to touch on it. I think, we're, yeah, I, it, it's obvious. I think it is obviously a cliffhanger. And I, I am interested, as you are, whether it means what 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 it means she's going to be doing she's obviously going to get metal a little bit more in their lives 
you can take that as a pejorative or as a positive, but I think that she's going to get involved, make her insert herself. Um, but uh, Alan says beforehand, you know, when he's talking about her or Brenda and her career, and he's in jail and they have that conversation, he says, we need to make some decisions. And he says the thing about, I didn't realize I was taking her out of one cage and put it in her tr into another uh, by putting her in a position where basically all she had was have kids and focus on the family. And I don't know, I, when I heard that, I'm like, is he, is this character saying this because of what he, what he knows happened or is there some other, we're yet to find out some stuff that's going to happen that's probably not good stuff with her getting involved because he sees whatever position he puts her in, whatever's yet, you know, coming in episode four, he feels like she's in a cage of some sort, which I thought was ominous, <laughs> an yeah. ominous statement. Yeah, she peers out the window Yeah, um, as it cuts away. Which I think is, you know, when you read about many um, fundamentalist groups, one of the tactics of control that, and we members of greater society contribute to is they convince them, yeah, I know it's scary on the inside, but it's way scary on the outside. And those other people on the outside will treat you way worse than we do on the inside. Yeah. And, you, and you see, that's what's going to happen with Brenda. Like she is losing more contacts with the outside world because, you know, she's going to have babies with Alan or whatever type things. And maybe he's in retrospect, he's sort of regretting that in a certain extent, but I mean, that's a technique used by, you know, uh, you know, misogynist abusers, you know, from time immemorial, right? You isolate your victim so that they have mm -hmm. less outside influence, they have less contact and they have less ability to kind of challenge your authority or get away. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's what you do. And that's what he's doing. I mean, he, and he's just following the pattern that he was given. I mean, I don't think the, the, the series or even the commentary focuses enough. I, this is a criticism I read today too. And I agreed with it. Like, the influence of that older patriarch on that family. Like, and and like, they're making sort of Dan and Ron out to be like the villains or whatever, but it's like, but again, it started with the the grandpa, right? I mean, right. Yeah, we haven't even really could... talked about that scene. I mean, Jessica touched on it where he's whipping his Dan, <laughs> right? In a parking a lot. Grown like... ass man. I mean, <laughs> crazy. Now, I... But also crazy because of, how true it rang for me in my experience. Yeah. Like, I, guess, yeah. I've, I have never seen anything like that where like, like a grandpa like beating his son so in, like corporal punishment like on your wedding day. Like, oh, of a grown man, just, yeah. Yeah. Was like, yeah. Whoa. Right. Just, yeah. I thought it was interesting to see like a contrasting like i felt that was very kind of um fundamental like the beating the kid like this is i am the father you will do what i say and you don't need to question me but the reason he was doing it was the son was almost more religious than him had bought in more to the we have god's law and we don't have to go in for we don't have to pay taxes and we don't have to use the federal government whereas the dad was like what are you talking like we follow, yeah. and they were they had a couple passages back and forth of biblical text or Book of Mormon text where they were kind of fighting with scripture on do we follow man's law or do we follow God's law and what's right and what's wrong. And it was I found that interesting that Dan at that point had become more more extreme in his views than even his father was. Yeah, I, I think that the the uh, dad is uh, trying to maintain his position as patriarch of the church of the not the church of the family, and realizes that uh, there's at least two <laughs> rivals to him in that yeah. in that scenario, and the one that might be that he might get a handle on is the one that he's going to take the lashes to. But when Ron comes around the corner. Uh, dad doesn't fare so well and yeah. which is a, maybe some foreshadowing of things to come and who is the real leader of the whole group and all all that kind of stuff 
Um, yeah, but Ron also isn't violent with him. Like he takes away the belt. He takes a punch from his father. He doesn't retaliate. And maybe it's because the lady drives up and interrupts the whole shebang. Yeah. But you could also see him, uh, what appears to look like holding back in that moment. So I, but that's what I was, the point I was trying to make earlier, like church aside, if you have a father that's instilling this fear and this threat of violence for not complying with his wishes, like that's going to breed violence or it can breed violence. So I think in that situation, and this is, it could be father and son, it could be man and man, it could just be person to person. I think Ron going up and stopping his dad from doing anything to his brother and basically taking away the belt and holding his father out with, and his father's taking swings at him. He's not taking, but the son's not taking, mm -hmm. but he can still controls the dad and puts him in his place mm -hmm. is, is a bigger power move than if he clocked his dad. Yeah. It's like, it's, true. it's like, I can control, you can, you resort to violence to, to get your way. I don't have to, I could put you in your place, old man, without even raising a fist. And and so I think that was a bigger power move. And that's probably, you know, the dad tries to talk with him as he's going in and try to put him in his place after that. But the damage is done. Like everybody that saw that interaction knows that Ron, Ron, Ron just got over on uh, grandpa. <laughs> One to zero. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, we're. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good take. <laughs> Well, we're coming up uh, over an hour on this thing. Uh, is there anything else that, was, that anybody has has been you pressing that you want to mention out this particular episode? Uh, I just am used to binge watching shows. So the <laughs> fact that I'm having to wait a week is new territory for me. So I'm really trying to just work myself through that. <laughs> There's... So I would search out some think pieces by Mormon historians. It's really interesting to watch them all grapple with <clears throat> A, the accuracy, mm -hmm. but also the reality of the accuracy versus the familiarity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is it perfectly historically accurate? No, but is it familiar? Yes. And it's like, where do you draw the line and how do you, what are you doing with it? And then, and like where people push it, because in the end, it's a Hulu miniseries that's done as a crime thriller, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's the way that it's marketed, and that's the way it is. It's also marketed to a non-Mormon audience, but yeah. you know, and it's it's fascinating because you watch Mormons grapple with it because it's really conflicted. But I, I agree with Ryan what he said last week. Many Mormons will not watch past this episode because of that temple depiction. That is really, it's uncomfortable to yeah. put it mildly. If you've been through the temple and the temple was a has ever been a special place or a peaceful place then to watch it connected to something like that is is really jarring yeah 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 i could imagine that to be very true well everybody thanks for uh participating i think we're all excited <laughs> for thursday to show up and so we can watch episode four and hopefully we can get together again <clears throat> and discuss it i uh I think there's seven episodes uh, there, so we're going to be, you know, more a little bit more than halfway through the over the next one, and uh, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm still waiting for the ladies' episode, the sisters. Yeah. So here's what I thought. I talked. To, uh, yeah, I I, I want to do one because I mean we're getting these bits of, from from like Jessica and stuff. Um, you know, I know Emily, uh, my wife. Is, is on board with it. So maybe like once the entire uh, series is over, we can have one just about like, basically I, I'll, the, I'll turn on the recorder. The plight of the sister. <laughs> yeah. Well, will you I, let that happen, Ryan. I, I, as a, will you allow that? As a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Uh, we'll, we'll see what my mood is. I might decree it. So, uh, <laughs> To be determined. Uh, yeah. Well, on that note. <laughs> Bishop Lowe, you get your own house in order and then you can start, you know. Oh, yeah. Nothing There's makes no me order cringe house. more. <laughs> yeah. Okay, everybody. All right, Thanks guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.